Good morning, ladies. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Carol Atkins, and I am on the Mums team here at Grace. And I am joined this morning by our speaker for the uh, for this month, uh, Robin Walters. And Robin is the Minister of Worship here at Grace. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. And you know, actually, I should say thanks for being with us again. <laughs> for some of us, um, we may remember back that uh, Robin was our speaker in December. And as uh, she was preparing for that, there was, um, the Lord was really speaking to her heart about another message to share. And as we worked through all of that, you know, we were praying about, do we go with the message that she was preparing or the one that the Lord was leading her to? And what we decided is she would go ahead and go forward in December with the message that she had prepared and then would come back in September, kick us off for our new season with the message that uh, the Lord was giving her um, also. So... I just, we never thought it would be like this, though, did mm -mm, we? Never. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are. So before we get going, I would really like to pray for us, pray for you, and then we'll get, uh, I'll turn it over to Robin. So pray with me, would you? Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for you. You are such an amazing, loving God. You are a God of faithfulness. You are a God of love, a God of gentleness. You are sovereign. You are good. Lord, you, you love us just so fiercely, and we're so grateful. Lord, we thank you for this day that we have. We thank you for Robin and her willingness to share such a deeply personal message. Um, and we pray that her message would be a source of encouragement to all those who are listening. Lord, thank you for this technology that allows us to share this message through, through um, the camera to so many people. Lord, we are just in awe of you. I pray today, Lord, that you would use Robin as your beautiful vessel to share um, such wonderful words we know that are straight from you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So ladies, again, thanks for being here. Grab a cup of coffee, some tea, settle in and be encouraged. God bless you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much again for having me here today. Um, it's an honor to be here to speak to everyone at MUMS. I'm thankful also in the room with me today are some leaders from the MUMS leadership team, and I'm excited that they're here in person to um, hear this message that God has put on my heart. Um, for those of you who don't know me, like Carol said, my name is Robin Walters. I serve here at Grace as the Minister of Worship. I've been on staff for over nine years, and I'm really thankful for how God has challenged me, both as a follower of Christ and as a leader in the church. Um, you'll see a picture of my family. I have been married to my husband, Charlie, for 17 years. Uh, he's a firefighter for the city of Strongsville, and he is a complete goofball. Anybody who knows him would definitely agree. Um, we have three kids. Jason is 16, Amaya is 14, and Eve is 11. So that's a little bit about me. So I would love to pray just quickly for our time as we launch into the message. Well, Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you, God, that um, you speak to us, that you speak to us so clearly um, in our time here on this earth. And Lord, our desire is that our ears and hearts would be open to everything that you want to communicate. And um, God, that we would not be so busy or have so much noise around us that we're not able to hear, take it in, and respond to what you're saying. Thank you for this season of life, even though it is hard. Um, we thank you for hard times. In Jesus' name, amen. So how many of you used to watch Disney movies when you were little, or you are like me and you are watching the Disney movies with your kids? I'm sure many of us are. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of different Disney movies and uh, ask you a few questions about them. Just think about the answers as you're uh, seeing these pictures. So this is our first picture. Okay. We all know this, Beauty and the Beast. So what's our plot line for Beauty and the Beast? Belle 
is searching for her father. She encounters the beast and he's mean, but then they fall in love and they get married and they live happily ever after. Second picture. This one is my all-time favorite Disney movie, The Little Mermaid. So our plot line for The Little Mermaid, we have Ariel who trades her voice for a pair of legs and ends up falling in love with Eric and Ursula the mean witch is all over the place and then in the end she ends up being able to get her voice back, keep her legs, they get married and they live happily ever after. Last one. All right, everybody knows this. We've been living in this land for a couple years now, frozen. Okay, so we have Elsa and Anna. Elsa's magical, Anna's not. There's all sorts of crazy things that happen. Hans ends up being the bad guy. In the end, they make up, Elsa lives, and they live happily ever after. So when you think about Disney movies, what do you notice about each of the movies? What are the quintessential must-haves in a Disney movie? Okay, so there's usually a hero. So that's Belle, Ariel, Anna. There's usually also a conflict or a hardship for this hero, and it's usually caused by a villain. There's always a villain. <laughs> so it would be the Beast, we have Ursula or Hans. But the one thing that every Disney movie has is a happy ending. So you have to be able to say, and they lived happily ever after. In fact, studies have shown that when movies with ambiguous or unresolved endings go in front of test audiences, they almost always bomb and they have to go back to the drawing board and rewrite the ending. I found this quote and it's by author Peter Chin. And he wrote this in an issue of um, Christianity Today. And it says, but this goes far beyond our taste in movies. It is a reflection of American culture as a whole, specifically the American dream. The American dream revolves around the belief that if a person works hard enough and generally treats others well, he will thrive in this country. And this is why we love happy endings. They are consistent with the American dream and serve to reinforce the rightness of that worldview. Without these conclusions, we experience uncomfortable levels of cognitive dissonance as we wrestle with the unfortunate reality that people often do not get what they deserve. In one respect or the other. So in this way, happy endings are not a preference for us, but a necessity, essential in helping us make sense of life. So as a culture and a people, we've come to believe that we not only deserve a happy ending for every story, but we expect it. Like somehow God made a mistake if a season doesn't end wrapped in shiny paper with a big red bow. So today I'm gonna take a little bit of a different spin on the faithfulness of God in this message that I'm calling Happy Ending Fail, The Faithfulness of God in Times of Deep Disappointment. So this is kind of a heavy message for me and um, it really calls for a great measure of vulnerability. So this has been heavy on my heart and it's hard because I think anybody who knows me would, <laughs> would definitely describe me as sunshine and rainbows. So. A message like this is hard for me to deliver. Um, it just feels weird. So God is stretching me a bit in this, but I really do believe that he wants me to share. So God led me to a passage in the book of Job as I was prepping this message. So the book of Job is narrative history. Its author is unknown, yet it's possible that Job himself wrote it. It's also possible that Job is the oldest of any book in the Bible, written approximately 2100 to 1800 BC. So I'm just gonna give you a quick summary. In the beginning, God tests Job's faithfulness through allowing Satan to attack him. So Satan is allowed to put Job through several trials, including the deaths of all of his children. 
his servants, his livestock, which were the source of his income. And so he lost all his money. And finally, he lost his health because he was covered with sores from head to toe. In these trials, all is lost, and his wife even tells him to curse God and commit suicide. But he remains strong and faithful. In chapter 1, verse 22, it says, In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with, doing, with wrongdoing. So along come Job's friends who give him plenty of bad advice in three rounds of discussion that end up lasting over 37 chapters. They mistakenly blame his sufferings on his personal sins rather than God testing and growing Job. One of them was kind of half correct in that God wanted to humble him, but this was only a part of God's test. So finally, in chapter 38, verse 1, God speaks to Job and restores him. God knows that Job has received bad advice from his friends, and the Lord spoke to Job out of this storm. And I love this. He says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? God fittingly declares that humans do not know everything. Then he humbles Job by asking a series of questions that could never be answered by anyone other than the Almighty God. And I just want to read you a little bit from chapter 38. And so he says, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? I love that passage. So then God brings him to an understanding that believers don't always know what God is doing in their lives. And in the end, Job answers and he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So then God blesses Job with twice as much as he had before his trials began. After this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And then Job died, an old man full of years. So in Job, we see a man who God allows to be directly attacked by Satan. He is an example of faithfulness as he loses everything important to him, yet remains faithful to God. And God remained faithful to him. Never once did he curse or blame God. And Job's life is a true testament to God's sovereignty and faithfulness during a time of great suffering. Now, it may seem that Job's story ends on a happy note, unlike a lot of the stories in the Bible. But I want you to catch what it says in verse 16, chapter 42. It says, And after this, Job lived 140 years. Now, that's a lot more life to live. And as far as we know, Job never learned the reasons behind all of the calamities that befell him. Yeah, he had more children, but what about his sorrow and mourning for those children that he lost? What about the physical and mental trauma and scars that no doubt he carried for the rest of his life? Job had a positive outcome with physical provisions, but it's not completely a happy ending. Too many loose ends remain, and there are just too many unanswered questions. The word says that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job, and indeed he did, especially when compared to everything that came before. 
but much still remained painful, incomplete, unanswered, and unfulfilled. So Job had to be wondering, what in the world was all of this for? So I told you before that I've been married for 17 years and we have three awesome kids. So I'm going to begin just this portion by sharing my journey that started in September of 2017. At the time, I was going through the Experiencing God study by Henry Blackaby, and if you haven't gone through it, you have to go through it. It is a fantastic, fantastic study. But I remember I got to this section where it talks about letting God do God-sized things in your life. And so I was downstairs sitting at my desk, and I remember I just stopped, and I held my hands out just in complete surrender, and I said, Lord, I am so desperate for you to do a God-sized thing in my life. I'll never forget that moment. So then a couple days later, I was sitting here at Grace in a staff meeting, and I remember we were talking about reaching out to refugees, uh, outreach, and other people in need, and I thought, oh, Lord, I just want to help. How can I help? And so I just started silently praying as I was in the meeting, and all of a sudden I was yanked out of my prayer by Jonathan's voice, and he said, adopt. And I snapped myself back into the meeting, and he continued to say, oh, no, that's not the word that I was thinking of. You know, just adopt. And I have no idea what he was talking about because I had just zoned out in prayer. But in that moment, like a shot, the Lord gave me a vision. And I've never, I mean, I've had maybe two or three visions or pictures given from the Lord in my life. And in that moment, he gave me one. And it was of a family portrait of my family. And there were other kids with us. And I remember that we were all dressed in white and we were smiling and hugging as if we all belonged together. And I can actually still see the face of the little girl. The vision was that clear. And now to give you some background, Charlie and I are definitely adventurous. <laughs> we love to try new things and keep life exciting, much to the chagrin of our family and friends. So even the summer before, we decided we were going to venture into a dog sitting business. And at times, we would board eight dogs at a time in our small house. We always thought it would be awesome if God called us to adopt, but we weren't actively pursuing it. We just kind of left the thought out there and wanted to stay open to whatever God had for us. So it was around this time that also Charlie had been dealing with a bout of several injuries back to back, and he had to take a leave of absence from work, and at that time he sunk into a deep depression. So things were not great at home. Um, he lived in a constant state of anger mixed with despair and discontentment. And I remember our kids would often say, when is happy Papa coming back? So when I heard this clearly from God, there was a little part of me that thought, maybe if God was calling us to this, that maybe it was to save Charlie. In the end, I guess it did, but not in the way I thought it would. So since we had mentioned adoption before, this was not a huge shock to me, but such a thrill to hear from the Lord so clearly. I could not wait to tell Charlie. So I texted him right away and said, I think we're supposed to adopt. <laughs> and of course he was like, what? So when I got home, I explained everything that had happened. So I have to say, from the get-go of this process, we always acknowledged that it was hard for Char to accept because he was not the one that received the vision from the Lord. Um, but we began to pray, and he agreed um, that we would pray, and we wanted to be truly open if God wanted us to do this. So we decided we were going to fast and pray for the whole month of November before making a decision. 
So we watched as God in that month bombarded us in such creative ways. It was crazy. Before I felt this call, I had never heard much about foster care or adoption and really only knew one family personally who had gone through that process. But it wasn't until after we decided to pray for November that we found out that November is actually National Adoption Month. <laughs> Wherever we went, there would be literal signs about foster care or people randomly telling us that we would be a perfect family for something like this. One time, I remember I attended a ministry function and I sat randomly at a table with three women who were all foster moms and had adopted as well. Then I think the last final straw, at the end of November, I just happened to lead worship at Grace on Adoption Sunday, where I had to watch a video about foster care, all four services, four times, and then transition into worship. So it just felt like the signs were really obvious. So on December 1st, we both decided to start training to become licensed foster parents with the hope to adopt. The training was really extensive. You have to do 60 hours of initial trauma training, but then along with mounds of paperwork and interviews before you enter what's called the home study process. So getting a home study to see if you're fit to take care of kids while you already have three kids is a trip. <laughs> In order to be approved to be a foster home, you have to be completely baby-proofed, have gates in front of every flight of stairs, post evacuation maps and house rules on every floor of your home. We also had to sit with a social worker for 10 hours, and all of our family members had to be interviewed and approved. Finally, at the end of May, we learned we were approved and ready to receive a call at any minute. At this point, there was a lot of anticipation, a lot of excitement as we waited. It was only two weeks, but it felt like two years. But then we finally got a call from the agency. They were looking to place two uh, twin two-year-olds and their one-year-old sister. And... I swear my heart was racing. I got the call when I was just ready to leave work and randomly I had ridden my bike to work that day. So I had to race home on my bike. I was so excited. So we had to get everything ready. We accepted the placement and learned that we would be picking up the kids the very next day. So June 6th, 2018, we were placed with Rain, Zephyr, and Athena and doubled our amount of kids in 24 hours. Our first two months were filled with adrenaline mixed with exhaustion. We adjusted to our new normal of three kids in diapers and three more in school. Charlie ended up being the primary caregiver during the day while I took over at night and whenever he was at the fire station. Life was overflowing with doctor's appointments, social worker appointments, two visits a week with their mom, and two separate visits a week with their dad, as well as all that goes along with being a toddler who's been taken away from their parents. Trauma was a word that we learned very well and came to realize was the cause of so much adversity that these kids had to face. In our training, we learned that every child who is displaced reverts back six months in development and behavior. Rain, Athena, and Zeph had already been moved twice by the time they came to us. They were so far behind, and it was really through no fault of their own. As much as we felt God was calling us to this, as the months went on, it became harder and harder to hear his voice. We began to experience attacks from the enemy like we had never seen before. There was a, a time I remember in September that I wrote in my journal and I just wanted to share a little portion of it with you. I wrote, this is by far the hardest thing we have ever been called to do. We are in a whole new level of desperate dependence on the Holy Spirit. God has definitely provided everything we need for each day, 
but we are for sure at the bottom of the barrel. The amount of crazy attacks have been surreal. So when the kids arrived, they instantly all developed fevers. Those fevers lasted the entire first month, along with raging diarrhea that lasted almost three months straight. I don't get sick very often, and I ended up getting sick for the whole first two weeks that they were there. I had a high fever. One strange one that happened next was that at the same exact time, Charlie and I both developed this intense muscle soreness in our hands, which caused us to not be able to write anything or even pick up a pen. In August, all three of them contracted hand, foot, and mouth disease, which caused sores to break out all over their faces and thighs, as well as their fingernails to fall off. Zephyr was quite a rascal, so falls which resulted in scrapes, bumps, and bruises were par for the course. Once their mom saw these normal toddler bruises and also claimed that Athena had a chipped tooth, which we couldn't see at all, she accused us of child abuse and made the county launch an investigation on us. We were told by our social worker that this is unfortunately normal, that it's a normal occurrence between birth and foster parents, but it left us completely discouraged and shaken. September came, Athena developed a high fever that lasted a week, so we ended up taking her to the ER and she was diagnosed with pneumonia. We spent two days in the hospital and I slept by her side. Soon after, I noticed our basement had four or five flies kind of oddly hanging around. So I bought a couple of those sticky ribbon fly strip things to catch them. The next day, I went downstairs and I had caught over 400 flies. I scoured the basement looking for the cause, but I never found anything. A few days later, I went down and there was and there our basement was covered in at least a hundred moths. Literally plagues of moths and flies. It was unbelievable. It was around this time also that our car, dishwasher, and freezer all broke within two days of each other. Zephyr and Athena started both biting every adult and kid that they could find and Zeph smashed his head into my face and gave me a black eye. So as hard as all this was, I just fell completely in love with these kids. And I found myself often having dreams about their high school graduations, prom dates, and other milestones. From the minute they came to us, I loved them as if they were mine. The only time that we could take a break would be if another foster family would agree to give us a respite day or a weekend. I also had a couple of amazing friends go through the entire training and background check process to be babysitters for us. As bad as we felt about just sending them off again to a new place for a weekend, we did begin to live for those times. Pretty soon we would send them for a day or two, close our front door, look around, and we didn't even recognize our lives or each other. Char began to pull even further away from all of us and became even more distant and angry. And I want to say before I continue on even more that um, he, has, he has given me full permission to share all of this. Um, I don't want you to think that I am bad-mouthing my husband or sharing more than he would be comfortable with. Um, he has given his blessing and definitely wants people to maybe hear from the Lord through our experience. Um, so it's all good with him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he began to become more distant and angry. Um, I honestly began to forget when the last time I had seen him smile or even laugh with us. 
our social worker began to get worried about him too, so she would call me every couple days just to make sure that everything was okay. Every day I began to hurry home from work each day to relieve him and ended up doing most of the evening care by myself. Screaming matches became normal and slowly I could just see that he was crumbling. I was getting desperate to hold on to both areas of my life and I offered, what if I went part-time at work or I switched my schedule around so I could be home more? But he just refused. He became demanding, sullen, and honestly instilled fear in myself and all the kids. I constantly felt like I had to rescue everyone. And the guilt that this had been my vision from the Lord became overwhelming. Our older kids began hiding out in their rooms most of the time. And I find myself alone, tired, and confused a lot. I knew God had called us to this, but what was he doing? Had I misunderstood him? I was still hearing from him clearly, but... I, I just felt like everybody around me was crumbling. So late October came, and I was called to a meeting at the County Office of Child and Family Services. They told me that they needed to know if we were going to for sure pursue adoption as the, county, or as the kids were about to be placed in permanent custody of the county by the new year. My heart sank as I sat in that room because I knew Charlie's heart. I pleaded with God to change Charlie's heart. I knew he would say no, but I literally could not bear the thought of having to let these kids go. I went home that day and I approached Charlie with the decision I knew we had to make. And as I tried to reason with him, he looked at me through tears, and I'll never forget this. He literally said, I am bleeding. I could see that he was drowning, and I tried to grasp on to any possible positive argument that I had. But as we talked about it more and more, he got more and more resolute. He was done and he wanted the kids gone. So we went the next three weeks hardly talking beyond every third day screaming match. But as time went on and I was taking more and more of the kids' care, God slowly revealed to me that our time with them was going to come to an end soon. And I just could not believe it. I thought, surely this is a mistake. God, fix Charlie. Knock some sense into him. We can't be one more family that abandons these kids. What in the world was all of this for? So at that time, the Lord brought several verses to me to call me. One of them was in Hebrews 4, Verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I definitely needed some grace and mercy. The next one was from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12 says, For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We have no power. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Then finally, one from Psalm 73, verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I have never felt such a polarizing sense of conflict in my heart before. And honestly, I really hope I never feel it again. Here was my husband in need of help that on this earth only I could give. 
And here, on the other hand, were these precious kids that I felt God had called us to care for. But God, in his ever-present faithfulness, began so softly to whisper to me and change my heart as I realized what we needed to do. I greatly struggled, as they tell you over and over again in your foster training, that the worst thing you can do is rehome the kids and how much that hurts them. And I just kept hearing that over and over again. But in the end, our social worker agreed that Charlie was not healthy and we needed to relinquish the kids to a family who was able to pursue adoption. We agreed that we would take the mandatory 30 days to make sure that this was the right course, but then we would have to say goodbye. So Thanksgiving came, and the Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, Charlie actually left for 12 days to go on a missions trip to Burkina Faso, West Africa. The kids and I had such sweet days when he was on his trip. His presence truly had become a subject of dread, and he instilled fear and anxiety in the room as we never knew how he was going to react or what he would do. And I look back now and I can see the kindness of God in giving us those days just to enjoy each other. When Charlie got back, he had had such a fantastic time, such a great heart-renewing experience with God. And I swear, I just saw this glimmer of hope that the man I married might return to us again. So we lived through our last couple weeks together, making as many memories as possible, but dreading the day we all knew was coming. December 26th, the day after Christmas. The social worker arrived to take the kids to their weekly visit with their mom, and they never came back. I remember I was zipping up Rain's coat, and he said, Mommy home and Rain home. Mommy, you home? Rain home. And I choked back tears as we said goodbye. My older three kids and I collapsed in a heap of tears and sobs as we watched them drive away. Charlie sat silently in the other room. After that, we decided to pack everyone up and randomly head down to Florida, Florida for a week of sun and rest. We scored a really nice Airbnb with a pool, so our kids just swam as we rested and reflected. Of course, I came down with pneumonia the very first day of our vacation and was bedridden a lot of the time. And God clearly showed me how hard I had been running for so long. That week was filled with Tears, laughter, deep talks, and I remember one night we were sitting at the dinner table and we just thanked our older kids for loving the little three so well. We talked about how we had seen God's hand and how incredibly hard it actually is to live out James 1 and to care for orphans as God commands us to do. When we returned home, Charlie and I both ran to counseling. He slowly realized the depression that had taken a hold of him had actually started years before, but grew in warp speed when we began foster care. Through counseling, we were able to express the pain, disappointment, and frustration we had experienced. I found myself realizing that as frustrated with Charlie as I was, I was equally frustrated with God. I don't think I ever really doubted him or I didn't blame him for any of it. I knew that somehow there was purpose. I just had zero idea what it was or why we had to go through so much pain for him to use us for his glory. So, 2020, 
fast forward two years. And time is kind. Our family is getting stronger by the day. Charlie continues to work through his depression, and I truly, <laughs> I haven't seen him this happy and closer to the Lord in a long time. Just within the last couple months, I think I've only cried about the foster kids maybe once. I find I can now actually look at pictures of them without having to catch my breath. And people ask me all the time if we've heard from them or if we get to see them at all. Unfortunately, when they left our house, there was not a single other family in our agency that was willing to take all three of them. So they went to a completely different agency and home. So we have had zero contact with them. All we know is that they were all able to stay together, which was a huge answer to prayer, but that they also now live about an hour away. I still would receive their mail until about maybe a couple months ago. I find any time that I'm out now, I'm constantly looking for them. <laughs> I'm always scanning kids' faces in stores. Um, if they look like them from behind, of course, I have to imagine them being two years older in the hopes that I would see them again. And I'm not really sure if God's kindness would allow me to, or honestly, if it's kinder for him not to. Just last week, my 14-year-old daughter, Amaya, just casually happened to mention that she chose to write her English essay on the little kids. I was completely surprised because out of all of our kids, she is the one who misses them the most and refuses to talk about that time. I asked her permission if I could read it, and I just want to share the closing paragraph of it with you. So she writes, that is the story of how God showed me that sometimes I do not know where he is going to take me, but I know that I can trust him. After they left, I became very stressed. I would always worry about them. To this day, I pray for them every night, hoping that they are all right. It kills me to talk about them because whenever I do, all of the pain from that day comes rushing back. This experience showed me that even though you might not know what God has in store for you, you need to trust him anyway. So things are still unresolved. I still have so many questions. And today, honestly, I wish I had this big exclamation point at the end of this message. I wish that I could truly wrap it in a bow for you guys and have this Disney happy ending. But I think at the end of my story, as it stands right now, September 2020, it's truly more of a dot, 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 question mark. But I think about Job's life after chapter 42. How long did it take him to heal? How long before he felt that sting of loss start to dull? And how long until the scars began to fade? How much faith did it take to trust God when Job never found out this side of heaven what all of it was for? One more quote. There's, off, there's a author and blogger, and his name is Tim Challies, and he says, There is danger in our dedication to happy endings. We may come to believe that God extends his goodness and grace only in those situations that end happily. We may believe that a happy ending is what proves God's presence through it. We may believe that the experiences that do not have a happy ending mean that God is somehow removed from it. 
We may resent the times that we do not hear the crescendo of music and see in our own lives a story other people will want to hear. We all desire happy endings to our suffering. Of course we do. But God does not owe us a happy ending, and he does not owe us the answers. At times he chooses to give us one or both. At other times, he does not. Someday, these things will make sense. And in that day, we will acknowledge that God has done what is right. But until then, it is faith in his character and in his promises that will sustain us far more than a happy ending. Let me pray. Lord, we know that you are here. We know that your presence never leaves us. You never leave us or forsake us. And God, in times where we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel or we have uneasiness with unanswered questions, I pray that you would grant us the faith and strength that would sustain us. That, Lord, we could lean against your throne and find our peace. And, God, that you would be all-sufficient and your grace and sovereignty would be enough for us. Lord, mold us and shape us through times where we struggle through times where we are frustrated or angry or met with uh, just unmet expectations. Lord, help us to take deep breaths each day and give us peace. May we hear your voice louder than anyone else's. And may we rest in your grace and your faithfulness each day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So I have some questions for you. If you've watched this video with someone else or if you want to think about these on your own or call someone to reach out and just talk through them, feel free. So here are our questions for you to ponder today. Is there a situation in your life that you have not yet received closure in? Number two, have you thought about what the Lord is trying to communicate to you by leaving it unresolved? And number three, what would it look like today for you to surrender the outcome of that situation over to God? Thank you so much for just allowing me to share today and being here today. I'm I'm honored. And I will pray for you that God continues to show his faithfulness no matter what your circumstances in life are. Thanks, ladies.